And good morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church. I'm Pastor Brooks. I'll be bringing you the word this morning as we're going through the book of Ephesians, sort of. Sort of. I'll explain the sort of in just a second. The last song that we sang, one of the bridge, or the chorus rather, we sang, Glory, glory, we have no other king but Jesus, Lord of all. I'd like to start out by asking you the following question. Who or what is your ultimate authority? I mean, we just sang that Jesus, we have no other king but him. But if the truth be known, that's dependent on any given day. Really, who we submit ourselves to, whether it's my own lusts, my, the lusts of my flesh, my desires, the desires of people, the desires of culture, or the desires of, of a church tradition, if you will. There's many, many, many things which we ascribe lordship to which aren't the Lord. Would you agree with that? So it really, it kind of depends. So when you think about it, what is your ultimate authority? How do you know that Jesus is your king of glory? Uh, moments before the, uh, the music, we, uh, we prayed for Elizabeth Schrock, who's going to go back to Asia for two more years uh, to, bring the, to bring the gospel to people who have never heard the name of Jesus and, and to continue to witness there. You can tell, you can tell that Jesus is her king of glory. Because that king, she receives her marching orders from said king, right? Now, having Jesus as your king doesn't necessarily mean that you go overseas to Asia to proclaim the gospel, but it does mean that we live our lives for him in light of who he is and what he's done. Would you agree with that statement if you're a follower of Christ? And if you're not a follower of Christ, I hope that you will be someday. And that's why we proclaim the gospel here. And here's what the gospel states. This was last week. We looked at the scripture. For by, the gra by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship, or rather his workmanship. Who is his in this text? Christ, God. Okay, we're his workmanship. We're his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good, work, good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when we ask the question, when I ask the question, who is your ultimate authority? Hypothetically, theoretically, we should be able to say that Jesus is my king of glory and that I take my marching orders daily from him. Daily from him. Why? Not so that I can earn my status with him, but because I've been raised to life in Christ. I was once dead, but I've been made alive. It's by grace through faith I've been saved. And because of that, I belong to him as a servant, as an adopted child, and as his missionary. That's all of us. That's all of us. Maybe. Maybe. And even if it is, even if it is, we have to acknowledge the fact that, well, let me ask, instead of me telling you, let me ask you, the quest, ask you this question. Is it possible for you as a believer in Christ to go two weeks, three weeks, a month later and forget that, practically speaking? Of course it is. We forget this stuff all the time. Case in point, take a look at Revelation chapter two. This is about 50 years after Paul penned the letter to the church in Ephesus. 50 years later, this is what Jesus said to the church in Ephesus via the apostle John. The seven letters to the seven different churches scattered throughout Asia. He writes to the church in Ephesus. He says, here's some good things I have. I think you're doing well. And then verses four and five, he says, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from this place unless you repent. Go back to verse 4. What's the problem with the church in Ephesus 50 years after Paul wrote Ephesians 2 verses 8, 9, and 10? What did, what did they do? They forgot. They forgot the gospel. This is super common. If the church in Ephesus can forget the gospel, then you and I can forget the gospel. This is not... Without historic precedent, there was a time in church history when I would say almost the entire church forgot the gospel. Today is October 29th, 2017. 
in two days, on uh, uh, October 31st, Tuesday, we will celebrate the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation. The Reformation marked a point in history where the church began to remember something they'd forgotten for about a millennia. I know that's crazy, but we're going to look at the five solas. We're going to anchor ourselves in the gospel. We're going to take five weeks. We're not really technically leaving Ephesians, by the way. How many of you have been on a family vacation in the Rocky Mountains before? Or anywhere where there's hills, right? Not Iowa. Well, we have some hills. Just they're not real. They're not mountainous. So you, you've gone on these, on, these, on these family vacations, and dad or mom has pulled over to the scenic overlook. Anybody done a scenic overlook? So you stop your, de- you stop your journey, and you, you pull over on the scenic overlook, and you enjoy the vista. That's what we're doing the next five weeks. We're not technically leaving Ephesians. We finished with Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. It's by grace through, through faith that you've been saved, and this is not of yourself so that no one can boast. Okay, we're stopping right there, and we're just going to camp right there on verses 8, 9, and 10. And as we camp there on 8, 9, and 10, we are going to go backwards in time and look at how the church rediscovered what they had forgotten. Similar to the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, we're going to look at the five tenets of the faith that they forgot, which if we don't forget, will root us solidly so that we keep the gospel preeminent and we never forsake our first love. The five solas, if you will, in Latin, sola means uh, uh, alone, Scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. So we're going to camp there for five weeks, never really leaving Ephesians, but anchoring ourselves in the gospel, and then we'll move on. So as we go to the first scripture alone, let's take a look at this scripture. Let's remind ourselves of what the gospel is, then we'll pray and we'll get to it. Paul says, for by grace... You have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Heavenly Father, as we open up your scripture, we pray that it would guide us. In truth, Holy Spirit, we pray that you would make the scriptures discernible to us, that we might apply them, believe them, and be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Help me to preach and teach this morning in such a way that Christ is honored, that he's exalted, and that he alone receives the glory. And we just pray, Father, you do a work this morning, which we can only attribute to your greatness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Scripture alone, sola scriptura, that's the first tenet of the five solas of the Reformation. Now, the Reformation was, I don't want to say started by Martin Luther, but he often gets the credit. What we're going to look at right now is, is, the, um, is the material cause, the material cause of the Reformation. In other words, what caused the big stink? What was the issue about that got the whole thing rolling here? Now, what we're looking at is a symptom. So if you have a sore throat, is that the sickness? No, it tells you there's something wrong, but it's not what's wrong with you. You say, I beg to differ, it hurts. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I'm saying there's an underlying cause. The underlying cause is not the symptom. Now, here's what happened on October 31st, 1517. A man, uh, a Catholic monk, German monk by the name of Martin Luther, went to the castle church in Wittenberg and nailed a, something called the 95 Theses on the door. Now, these 95 Theses, this, now some of you, when you think of Protestant Reformation, you think of Luther kind of ro- coming in with these flowing robes and his bald monk, listen, he comes in, he's like, takes out this big thing. He's like, I'm going to start a Reformation. Boom, <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> take that, Catholic church. That's not what happened at all. What happened was Luther writes 95 theses in Latin because he doesn't, this isn't, he doesn't expect this to be a big deal. 
He expects this to be an internal academic debate among people who are versed in Latin because the common man doesn't understand Latin. The Bible's only in Latin in Luther's day, right? So he wants to have a debate and a discussion amongst professors and people of his own, of his own, uh, his own tribe, if you will, to discuss some of the troubling issues that he sees in their, in their day. And it all centers around something called indulgences, indulgences. The Catholic Church at the time, in fact, they still do believe this to an extent, although it's modified since this time, they believe in something called the treasury of merit. The scriptures say that the blood of Christ is sufficient to atone for all sin. Would you agree with that? Because that's what the scriptures teach. They took it a step further and believed that Christ, his merit was not only sufficient for to cover our sins, but the merit of the saints, Mary and the rest of the saints, they did so much good, more than they needed to do to get into heaven, there was a surplus, a treasury of merit, if you will, that the Pope had the authority to merit or to dole out to other individuals who lacked merit. Okay, this is the treasury of merit. And one of the ways by which the Pope could grant someone merit from the treasury of merit, if you think of it as a bucket, he could ladle out some, some merit from the treasury of merit because there was so much. One of the ways that a person would access this treasury of merit was something called indulgences. Indulgences were you would pay a sum of money to the church and then they would then take time off of your purgatory or if you had a relative in purgatory. You say, what is purgatory? Purgatory is not hell. Purgatory is a holding place that the, that the Catholic Church believed there was a holding place before heaven where if you were saved by grace, but you didn't have enough grace because your sins kind of mucked that up a little bit, you're going to have to burn some of those sins off. It's not eternal punishment. It's just, it's temporal. And then eventually you'll get into heaven. So indulgences were a way that you could shrink that time off, right? So Take a look at what one of the, the contemporaries to Luther would go around Germany and he would preach. This is taken from one of his sermons. Don't you hear the voices of your dead parents and other relatives crying out, have mercy on us for we suffer great punishment and pain. From this you could release us with a few alms. We've created you, fed you, cared for you and left, your temp left our temporal goods. Why do you treat us so cruelly and leave us to suffer in the flames? when it takes only a little to save us. Now, this is the Catholic Church in the, in the 16th century version of a capital campaign. I'm not joking. What he would then do with these indulgences, he would bring them back to Rome and they used this to build St. Peter's Basilica. So this was a fundraising cap campaign. Now, eventually Grace Community Church, we're gonna have a capital campaign and we're going to probably redo this whole building. I promise you, I will never preach anything like that. Cross my heart, hope to die, and if I do, I hope that I die. So, and some of you will probably aid me in that speedy death if I actually do that. That's horrible. That's horrible. That's what Luther's protesting. But it's not really a protest so much as it is we need to have a discussion. We need to have a discussion. Now, what language did he write this in? He wrote it in Latin. Germans don't speak Latin unless they're educated, very educated. So he doesn't expect this to go viral. But somebody pulled it down off of the door and translated it into German without his permission. And the newly invented Gutenberg Press, they made all sorts of copies and distributed all over Germany. In other words, someone tweeted it. Okay, that's what happened. This is the 16th version of Twitter, century version of Twitter, and it literally went viral. Now, once the common German got a hold of this debate, they were all about this. They had no idea what the scriptures meant because nobody read the Bible except the priests, and only then in Latin. So they didn't know what the Bible said, but they were smart enough to know that something's off with that, and they didn't like it. So they were all in Luther's camp. So this got to be a big public brouhaha that was not Luther's intent, but nonetheless, that's what it became. So now, fast forward to four years later, 
The diet of worms is not a trendy diet plan that enhance to lose weight. The diet of worms is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a court, is a court in the city of Worms. Whenever you see German and a German word and it's a W, it's always pronounced with a V. It's Worms, not worms. Don't think nightcrawlers. Okay? So here we are. We are at the Diet of Worms, called to by this guy who you can't really see his face because the PowerPoint won't light that up. That's Emperor Charles V. He's got a really ploofy hat and he looks awesome. So he's sitting there on his throne. He is the Holy Roman Emperor of all, all of Spain, um, Brazil, whatever the Catholic Church rules over, he is the state head. Now, the Pope is the spiritual head. He's the state head. So he has all the authority. He commands armies. So he calls this together, and you have the Catholic officials here dressed in red and, and their awesome Popish hats and so forth and so on. And they are trying Luther. And here's what they're demanding. They're demanding that Luther recant, take everything back. Here's an interesting little factoid. Luther thought the Pope was going to back him. He was sadly mistaken. He was sadly mistaken. So ultimately he had the full force of the Catholic Church saying, you either recant or you're toast. Now when I say toast, I literally mean toast because John Huss earlier had preached the gospel that justification is by faith alone, and they lit him on fire, literally, for that. So basically, Luther knows the stakes here. What do I do? What do I do? So he says to them, give me 24 hours. And he goes and he prays, and 24 hours later, he comes back and says, unless... I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and councils, for they've contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the word of God alone. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. God help me. Amen. Okay, so you see, there is the symptom, the symptom is indulgences and the abuses that surrounded it. But that's not the root cause. The root cause of the sickness is where authority actually comes from. That's the issue. That's the primary issue here. That's foundational. Indulgences, yeah, that's dumb. That's dumb. He's protesting that. But where do they come from? How do you get to that place where that seems like a good idea? to go around and tell people that if you give 100 bucks, Aunt Beatrice will uh, be a less purgatory for a hundred, couple hundred years. Where do you get that? There's no chapter and verse for that. In case you're curious, it doesn't exist. You get that through years and years and years and years of tradition. And Luther's saying, my conscience cannot be bound by your tradition, but only scripture alone. The sickness is where does the final authority lay? All right. With Rome, they believed, and I, by the way, I want to make sure in case you're, you're thinking this, I am not saying, and nor was Luther saying at the time, that the Catholic Church of his day and the Catholic Church of today do not believe that the Word of God is wholly inspired by God and inerrant. They believe that. The same way that I do, okay? Luther wasn't saying they didn't believe the Bible was true, nor am I. So don't hear that. Here's what, they were, what Luther's acknowledging is that their authority is the Scripture plus the traditions. Make sense? Scripture plus, and they're on equal footing. It's not Scripture's on top of, no, they're equal, they're equal footing. And when I say church tradition, I mean the popes and the councils and so forth that the pope calls together. They believe the scripture was inerrant, but they also believe the papacy was inerrant. They go together like heads and tails, makes one coin. Luther's like, not so much. Luther's conviction is scripture alone. Why? Because he could go back and look at the last 15, actually about 1,200 years of church history since Constantine. Church started to get weird after the Roman emperor converted, and now all of a sudden Christianity became the state-sanctioned religion. Now you had money and power, and things pretty much went after that. And so that's how you get to this place, money and power, money and power. So anyway, Luther's like, listen, you can look at the, at the declarations of the popes for the last 1,200 years, and you can say that this pope blatantly contradicted this pope. Therefore, they can't be both inerrant, and both of them contradicted the scripture. 
So he's just using common sense. He's saying, listen, scripture alone is the only thing that can bind my conscience. We have an abuse going on here and nobody's dealing with it. His intent was not to start a new religion. His intent was to call people back to the scriptures. It didn't work out that way. It didn't work out that way. Uh, by the way, a couple things that Luther's not advocating, nor am I advocating. He's not saying, he's not advocating for private interpretation. I remember when I first became a Christian, I shared my faith with my family. I was talking with uh, um, various family members, and I would quote something like, they'd say, well, what do you think the Bible says? And I'd say, well, the Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 6, that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And then I would hear this, well, that's your interpretation. It's not an interpretation. I just read from you the text. It's not an interpretation. Okay, when you look at John 14, verse 6, there are probably, however many people are here, there's that many applications. What do I mean by application? I mean by application, you take a truth of Scripture and you apply it to your life and you adjust your life because of what it says. That's called an application and that's different for you, 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 and you. So if there's 500 people here, there's 500 potential different applications. There's only one meaning. Okay, just because the Scripture alone can bind my conscience or your conscience doesn't mean that we all have the right to make it mean or say whatever we wanted to say. That is not true. Luther is not advocating for everyone to privately interpret the scripture apart from reasonable uh, discussion, even group discussion about what the scriptures say. Does that make sense? He's not calling for a radical individualism, which is very common in the West. He's calling for, calling for common sense. Well, let's study it. What does it say? Do you see that the Bible teaches that we should do indulgences? That's all he wanted. That's all he wanted. What is the final authority? Authority is the, the scriptures, not some council from a couple hundred years ago or from 50 years ago. He's not advocating for private interpretation. He's also not stating that tradition isn't relevant. What our forefathers said about the scriptures are important. For example, let's say that we're going through the rest of the book of Ephesians and I get to Ephesians chapter five and I throw a totally new twist on, on male-female relationships in such a way that you sit back and go, that's new, I've never heard that. You should probably stop and question whether or not you should keep hearing that. Anytime someone comes up with something totally novel, totally new, that no one's thought of in the last 200 or 1,000 years since the New Testament was written, you should probably pause and say, I wonder if they're reading that correctly. And if you don't, then that's shame on you. That's how cults begin. Nobody questions the guy behind the pulpit. Well, he's the one who studied it. He went to seminary, or at least he stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. We should give him the benefit of the doubt, shouldn't we? No, you shouldn't. Not if what they're saying goes against the scripture. So he's not stating that tradition isn't relevant. Tradition informs how we look at scripture. Now here's the cap, here's, here's where it all comes together. Scripture should judge tradition, not the other way around. Does that make sense? We look at our traditions and we say, is that tradition in line with scripture? We do not look at the scriptures and saying, is that verse in line with my tradition? Do you see the vast difference? That's the problem. That's the problem. Scripture should judge tradition, not the other way around. A couple verses where the scriptures speak about the scriptures. Paul is writing to his apprentice who's been on many missionary journeys with him. His name is Timothy. It's called the letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy, his second letter to Timothy. And he says to him, by the way, Timothy is the pastor or one of the pastors in the church in Ephesus. So this whole Ephesians thing here, we, we see it played out. He's writing to the pastor or one of the pastors at the church in Ephesus. And he says, all scripture, all of it, is God breathed. It's, it's, it's breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness that the man of God might be complete, equipped for every good work. Okay, so what is the origins of scripture? Where does scripture come from? According to this text. It comes from God. It's breathed out by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, this does not mean that God dictates to Paul. It wasn't like, okay, Paul, are you ready? Do you got your quill? Do you got your parchment? 
all scripture. Paul's like, wait, 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 you're going too fast. Go too fast. Back up. What'd you say? Now that's, that's dictation. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about here, Peter articulates in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which we will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So when you read Peter's letters or Paul's letters or John's letters or the Matthew or the gospel according to Matthew, you see that their own personality and their own speaking or writing styles are evident in each one. They're not, they're not robots that are dictating their personalities, their grammatical styles, their, their educational background is all apparent. So what, what John says is different than what Paul says, but they say the same thing. And there's a cohesiveness throughout the entire Bible, whether it's Genesis all the way through Revelation. 66 different books, various different authors spanning thousands of years, different ways of life, different educational backgrounds. And yet there's a cohesiveness all throughout the Bible because the Holy Spirit inspired them, did not dictate to them, but inspired them. Because of that, the scriptures are inerrant. In other words, in their original documents, which none exist, by the way, uh, today, the original documents are believed to be without error. The copies are not believed to be without error. There are monks who misspelled words. And sometimes you'll get to, say, John chapter 8, and if you look in your Bibles, and I think in um, some of your Bibles, there'll be a, a parenthetical statement that says that uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 8, is not found in many of the earliest manuscripts. What does that mean? It means that we have thousands and thousands of copies of the New Testament. And sometimes there's a few verses not in some of them. Or you'll see words which are spelled differently or, or little teeny variances. But it doesn't ever change the, the whole meaning of, of the whole. And so therefore what we have is reliable but the original is, is believed to be without error because it comes from God and God does not lie nor does he commit error. Now, I don't interpret the Bible without error. Why? Because I'm a dude. I'm not inspired by the Holy Spirit. I have been given reasonable faculties. I'm aided by the Holy Spirit, but I have said things before in preaching which are just flat out wrong. It's not that I intend to be wrong. I am just flawed and frail as a human being with human weaknesses and limitations. So I can misinterpret the Bible. I can misread it. I can misapply it. But it in and of itself is my foundation. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what, that's what we're saying here. Let's keep moving along. What is your final authority? I didn't ask what should your authority be. What is your authority? How do you find out what your authority is? Ask yourself the following question. How do I make my decisions in life? When I come to a fork in the road and I go right or left, how do I determine right or left ethically? Some people, you would say, I am my own authority. Well, thank you for being honest. There's two types of I am my own authority people. There are secular people. These individuals do not acknowledge God and they say, therefore, I do as I please. I am the master of my own fate, the captain of my own ship. I am my own GPS. I tell myself what's next. Okay, makes sense? Now, some of you might fall into that category. Now, most of you, because you're in church, probably don't see yourself as secular However, there are many people that attend many different varieties of churches, including this one. They might not say you're this, but you are. You are religious, but you are your own final authority. Why? Because you have a mild affinity for Jesus. When you hear about Good Friday and the cross, sometimes it makes you teary-eyed, but you do nothing with it. It doesn't change how you live your life. You're still going to do what you're going to do and don't let anyone confuse you about the details and what does Jesus have to do with what I'm going to do. 
yes, I'm all grateful that he went to the cross and that makes me cry and I'm glad that he died for my sins, but this week, next week, and the next 20 years, what I do has nothing to do with what he did for me. That person is their own authority. This is what James is referring to when he says, don't be like them who are hearers of the word but not doers, who, who treat the law, they look in the, in the word of God like a man looking into a mirror and walks away and immediately forgets what he's seen. Okay, that's that person. That person is their own authority. They may be religious though. Now, that's not all religious people. There are some, tradition is their authority. In other words, they, they are not their own authority. They will submit to something, but what is that something? For some people, it's religious authority. My church tradition is my final authority. That's what got Luther into hot water. He's challenging church tradition, not the scriptures, but the tradition of the church and how they interpreted the scriptures. So there's religious authority. There's also family. My family is my final authority. You don't know how common it is for people to become coming, they start coming to Grace Community Church and sometimes they're in college and they get all excited about Jesus and their family thinks they're in a cult now. Why? Because they're excited about Jesus. Well, they must therefore be in a cult. Why? Because the church tradition they went to was torture. They'd sit there and, and they'd have to be drugged to church and nobody was excited about Jesus. And then somebody gets up and he raises his voice and starts crying. Well, that's a cult. How do you know? Well, he cries when he preaches. Oh, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Doesn't make any sense at all. But nonetheless, people think that. Here's another one. People come to Grace or come to any church that preaches the Bible and, and they find out that, oh, look, they, do, they practice believer's baptism. In other words, when people receive Jesus by grace through faith, they therefore want to become baptized as an expression of their faith because that's what Peter taught and, and Paul taught and you see this in the New Testament and they come to the place where they're like, okay, yeah, I'm convinced that this is what the scriptures teach but I'm not gonna do it. Why not? Well, because I was baptized as a baby and that would really tick my parents off. Okay then, now we know where your authority is. I, that's difficult. Now, that's mild in the United States. Big deal, your parents are mad. Okay, I don't wanna make light of that but in some places, when people come to Christ, say if you come to Christ in Saudi Arabia and you tell dad or your brother, if you're a female, that you're now following Jesus, that will get you an honor killing potentially. This happens all the time in the Middle Eastern culture. In other words, someone comes to Christ and because they've dishonored their traditional religion, they've dishonored their family, now the family takes care of their family honor and now puts that person to death. This is not an ancient thing, it's a now thing. So this is a real thing. And that looks different, the levels of persecution from family or religion are different. But you also have secular, uh, secular um, authority. Secular authority is, whichever way the culture says, that's where I'm going. So I take my cues, not from the word of God, but from the culture. What is the winds of the culture saying about the latest moral issues? Well, then that's what I have to believe. I'm gonna go with culture because after all, we all know that the majority is the wisest, right? Please tell me you understand that that's sarcasm. The majority is not always right. The majority is just the one who has the might. And then, you've heard of this? The intolerance of tolerance, okay? The intolerance of tolerance is currently what our culture does when you buck its authority. The chief virtue in our, in our culture right now is the virtue of tolerance. And if you in any way disagree with anyone else in our culture about anything, you are intolerant and they will not tolerate your intolerance. Therefore, they will conform you to their image or they will silence you. And therefore, it's not, Christians, therefore, they tend to be silent and they, they won't speak about this issue or that issue because, you know, they don't want to buck their tradition of the secular culture. Make sense? Now, here's the reality. Whenever tradition, whenever tradition stands over scripture, it always leads to oppression. There's not an exception. It'll all, I guarantee you it'll always lead to oppression. Here's what Jesus says, or rather the Pharisees say to Jesus, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And Jesus answered them, and why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded on your father and mother, and whoever reviles his father or mother must surely die. But you say... 
In other words, your tradition teaches that if anyone tells his father and mother, hey, what I would have gained, uh, you would have gained from me, I give to God. He need not honor his mother and father. So for the sake of your tradition, you've made void the word of God. Whenever a person, a family, or a church, or a culture makes void the word of God for the sake of any type of tradition, someone will suffer, guaranteed, guaranteed. Luther, John Huss, challenged the tradition of the church because he clearly saw that the scriptures taught that man is justified by faith, not by works. They lit him on fire. They would have done the same to Luther, but he had a very powerful friend who had a castle and an army. And Luther hid in said castle with said army surrounding said castle for a full year and translated the Bible into German. Otherwise, he too would have been toast, literally. This is always the way it is. If you buck tradition of any kind, you stand to suffer. This is just the way the world works. Why is it that it doesn't matter what kind of tradition, whether it's religious, whether it's family, or whether it's secular, why is it that that always leads to oppression? Because tradition never understands grace. What do we look at in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10? It is by what that you've been saved? By grace, through faith. And this is the gift of God so that no one can boast. No tradition understands grace apart from revelation. The traditions of man, whether it's religious, whether it's secular, whether it's family, always says, if you can do these things, you too can be awesome like us. And if you don't, we'll make you awesome, or we'll get rid of you for not being awesome. Does that make sense? You just had an explanation of the last 5,000 years of human history and atrocities right there. That's it. It's not more complicated than that. There are nuances to be sure, but that is the common thread that goes through all of those, those oppressive atrocities. And by the way, Luther actually perpetrated some of those later. And so did the other Protestant reformers. So I don't want to lift these men up and saying they're without sin. They're not. They're not. They too oppressed those who didn't believe the same way that they did. So don't don't hear me say that Luther's awesome, everyone else sucks. That's not the case. I'm saying that when you allow yourself to your, your, your understanding of scripture to be formed strictly by your tradition, it'll lead to someone else getting hurt every single time. Every single time. Okay, let's go back to this funky picture here. This guy that you can't really see with the floofy hat, his name is, his name is Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Okay, there's a, a little bit better picture of him there. So Charles V Uh, was the Holy Roman Emperor. He was the state leader of everything the Catholic Church controlled, right? And so he's the one who called this. Now, years and years later, because of his religious tradition and his family tradition, he had a grandson who became a Protestant. In other words, he married someone who was not a Catholic. He became a Protestant. He left the Catholic Church, and he was subsequently disowned by his family, And then this person then moved to the new world in the 17th century. So he moved to this continent and settled in uh, in Virginia and then had descendants who then migrated further west to eventually they lived in Missouri. And then they had descendants who had some descendants who had some descendants. And then I met Charles V's great, 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 great granddaughter in college in 1986. Her name was Stacy Rolls. Now, Stacy Rolls then introduced me to this, my final authority, which is the Word of God. So, because of the persecution of tradition and religion, The grandson was booted, and I'm thankful that he was. 
So God's sovereign authority reigns supreme even over stupid tradition, stupid families, and stupid people. Because the word of God is sufficient and the word of God states that God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. All things work for the good of those, including stupid people, stupid traditions, and stupid practices. God somehow uses all of this to bring glory to himself. Now, as we close, I want to encourage you to be what I would refer to as a Berean. Acts chapter 17. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. That's from Thessalonica. That's where they were. They just preached the gospel. And when they arrived, they went to a Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Little contrast. When they were in Thessalonica, Paul and, 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 uh, and Silas preached the gospel. And everyone said, hey, it's Paul. He's awesome. What he says is true. The Bereans were way more noble than that. Paul came in and preached the gospel and they said, hey, Paul, time out. We'll get back to you on whether or not what you say is true. We have to check what you're saying with the scriptures. Now, what is Paul saying? Just read Ephesians. He's telling them what we just covered last week. Now, they're taking what he said, which is the gospel, and they're going back to the Old Testament, and they're like, okay, <laughs> keep going. That's what's going on. Now, for you to do that, what must transpire? This has to be here. You can't be a Berean if you don't read the scriptures. You can't. I can fleece you. Or whoever follows me can fleece you. And believe me, there will be people who will try to fleece you. You do aware that there are John Tetzels in the world that are preaching indulgences. It's called TBN. Just turn it on. It looks different, sounds different, but they're very similar it's always send us your check and you too will be blessed. Doesn't, you, do you see the similarities? If you're not a Berean, you'll fall for that garbage. You'll fall for that. You have to measure what is said from the pulpit or from the podcast or from the latest Christian book. You have to measure that against what the scriptures say. But for you to do that, what has to happen? You've got to know what the scriptures say. You've got to get away from the mentality that Pastor Book Brooks opens up the Gerber and, and says, train's coming, choo-choo. You've got to get past that. You have to view this as supplemental to your daily feeding. I'm so, I didn't mean to diminish. No, I did. That was total mockery, wasn't it? Okay. But it was fun for me anyway. No, you've got to become feeders of the word. You've got to get into it daily. We're going to post some stuff on, on our app in terms of resources that will help you better mine the scriptures for yourself, for yourself. They're not on there yet, but I'm going to talk with, uh, with our technology people. We'll get those up. A uh, couple books that you can read. Number one, uh, Howard Hendricks book, Living by the Word. I think it's Living by the Word. That's why we're going to put it up on the app. It's, I've read it. I've gone through it with many, many people. But it's Howard Hendricks, Living by the Book. That's what it is, Living by the Book. So great, great book on how to read the scriptures. Get into a daily reading plan. Read the scriptures together in the context of community. But whatever you do, be a Berean. Be a Berean. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Luther's courage. Um, 500 years ago when, when he stood his ground and no doubt was afraid of the consequences, but we thank you that he did stand his ground. And we pray, Father, that uh, you would give us the courage to, to stand firm, to trust in you by grace through faith, to mind the scriptures for ourselves. And I pray, Father, for those who are, who are just kind of intimidated by the Bible, it's new to them. I just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would encourage them, equip them, and that they would just pick it up and start reading in the Gospel of John or the New Testament just to become familiar with it, Lord. I just pray that you would um, draw people 
to yourself through the word of God. We thank you that faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. Thank you for your gospel and thank you that it's all of grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. God bless, go in grace. We'll see you next week.